Okay, uh, so it's officially time. I'll start with the introduction uh, and warm welcome to Barak Shoshani, who's going to give our talk today. Uh, Barak is currently, uh, co just has just completed a postdoc in uh, Perimeter Institute in, uh, in Canada, Waterloo, uh, where he also did his PhD. He's, he's now working for the University of Toronto as a, a quantum mechanics lecturer. Uh, and he'll talk to, talk to us today about some of his work, uh, still at Perimeter, about time travel and, and GR and other uh, relevant theories. And we all uh, hope to hear that it's possible and so we can talk <laughs> again and again and uh, invite our, our friends from long ago. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. My talk is going to be specifically about time travel and its paradoxes. Please do feel free to ask questions throughout the lecture. Um, if you have anything that is unclear, I'm happy to clarify it. So this talk is based on two papers. The one on the left here, it's basically lecture notes for a undergraduate course I taught on faster than light travel and time travel, but it also serves as a, basically a literature review of all the latest research in this area, and it has been published on SciPos, which is a peer-reviewed journal. There's also this archive preprint that I wrote with my student, Jacob Hauser, and I'm going to talk about our work towards the end of this, uh, of this talk. So first, I'm going to teach you basically in 20 seconds all of general relativity. So space-time, causality, geodesics, and curvature. Then I'm going to talk about faster-than-light travel. So there are some exotic space-time geometries like warp drives and wormholes that seem to allow faster-than-light travel. Next, I'm going to talk about the feasibility of those space-time geometries. So we'll learn about the energy conditions, which are specific conditions that we think matter should satisfy in general relativity. But I'll also tell you about how these conditions are violated. And you'll see that the warp drives and wormholes both require matter that violates these energy conditions. It's called exotic matter. I also talk about the quantum inequalities, which are basically ways to put a bound on how much violation of the energy conditions you can actually generate. Then I'm going to talk about time travel. So first of all, how you can use faster than light travel to travel back in time. So if you have a warp drive or a wormhole, you can actually use that to create a time machine. And then I'm going to talk about the time travel paradoxes and possible resolutions. Finally, I'll talk a bit about my own research, which is studying different models for multiple histories, which is one particular way to solve time travel paradoxes. So I'm going to talk about different variations of these models and some concrete analysis I did with my students to see in which cases exactly do these models solve paradoxes or not. Okay, so let's start with a quick review of general relativity. So first of all, we have here a space-time diagram. So the observer is here in the middle. Time is the vertical axis, and for each point in time, there is a plane of that present point in time. So here, this gray plane is actually the plane of the observer. And there are also the past and future light cones. So the light cone is basically all the places you can reach if you travel at the speed of light. So this is where light can reach. And inside the light cone is all the places you can reach when you travel slower than light. So for example, this spaceship is traveling slower than light, then it is inside the light cone. If I was traveling faster than light, then I would be outside of the light cone. Similarly, the past light cone is all the places that could influence the observer, provided that, of course, they can only travel slower than light. 
in general relativity, there's kind of this interplay between matter and the geometry of space-time. So space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. Now, this part, that matter tells space-time how to curve, is given by the Einstein equation over here. And you can see an illustration here. So I have uh, the Earth, and this grid is basically the curvature of space-time. And you can see that the presence of this mass causes space-time to have curvature. Now here on the left, space-time tells matter how to move. This is given by the geodesic equation. And here is just one less dimension for simplicity. So you can see that here I have a planet, and here I have another planet. And those planets cause these dents in space-time, so they cause curvature. And now this red line is a geodesic, so this is the path that a particle would take. And if there was no curvature, this path would just be a straight line. But because there is some curvature here, it causes this geodesic to change the path and kind of go around this planet. Here you can see something that causes the curvature to actually be infinite. So this is of course a black hole, and if you are a geodesic going into a black hole, then you go in and then you can never come out of it. Okay, good. So now we all know general relativity. We can start talking about faster than light travel. And to give you some motivation for it, I want to talk about the expansion of the universe. So as we all know, the universe is expanding. This is given by this line element here, where a is called the scale factor, and it's a function of time. If a equals 1, then the line element of space-time is just a flat one, the Minkowski line element. So d sigma is just the spatial line element, and minus t squared is the time line element. But when a changes, it scales space. Time is unchanged, but space gets scaled. And you can see here that a started small and is increasing as time passes. And this is why the universe is expanding. One thing you can prove from that is the Hubble's law. This law basically says that the velocity in which galaxies are receding away from us due to this expansion is linearly proportional to the distance of the galaxy from us, which is d. And the proportionality constant is the Hubble constant. So, you can see here on this plot, distance is the horizontal axis, velocity is the vertical axis, or redshift, and you can see these galaxies are all solved on one line, because it's a linear relation between distance and velocity. The value of this Hubble constant is 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So what this means is that if there is a galaxy that's one megaparsec away from us, then its velocity is going to be 70 kilometers per second. And you can calculate that if the galaxy is 4500 megaparsec away from us, the velocity is going to be the speed of light. And in fact, since it's a linear relationship, 9000 megaparsec away from us galaxies are moving at twice the speed of light. So why does this not violate relativity? Well, it's because the galaxies themselves are not moving. In fact, the galaxies could just be at rest with respect to space. But what happens is the space between us and the galaxy is expanding. And this expansion causes the galaxies to effectively move away from us with the velocity given by h0 times d. So it seems like there's kind of a loophole where even though relativity limits you to the speed of light, it doesn't limit the rate at which space can expand, and it can seem like things are moving away from us much faster than light. 
we can take advantage of this loophole in the design of a warp drive. So warp drive is given by this metric and there's a function f of r which is basically one inside the bubble which is basically this area here where the, where the spaceship is and zero outside the bubble which is this area outside. So outside the bubble f equals zero and you can see that this becomes just the flat metric. Okay, minus the t squared plus the x squared plus the y squared plus the z squared. There's no curvature. But when you add this f, then these parentheses become dx minus v dt. And what this means is that space itself, or at least the bubble, the part of space inside the bubble, is actually moving at the velocity v. And this v can be anything. It can be slower than light, it can be faster than light, because there's no limit on how fast space can move. What this plot actually tells you is the expansion of space. So you can see here behind the spaceship there's positive expansion, right? so the vertical axis is expansion. Behind the spaceship there is positive expansion, so the space is expanding behind the spaceship, and in front of the spaceship there is negative expansion, which means that space is contracting ahead of the spaceship. And this combination of expanding behind and contracting in front of the spaceship basically moves this space between the warp bubble, which includes the spaceship inside it. So just like for the galaxies, the spaceship can actually be at rest, but space itself is moving at whatever velocity this metric dictates. Now, you can calculate from this metric the slope of the light cones. So you can calculate that dx dt is plus or minus 1 in a flat space, so when f is equal 0 outside the bubble. But inside the bubble, where f is equal 1, you actually get an additional contribution to the slope of the light cones given by the velocity. So I actually have a mathematical demonstration here what you can see is a space-time diagram. So here is the origin, the horizontal axis is the x-axis, and the vertical axis is the t-axis. And you can see that I plotted two types of light cones. So there is this big global light cone, which is similar to the one we saw in the first slide. Okay, so this pink triangle is the global light cone of this observer that's at the origin, which means that this observer, if they could only travel slower than light, they would have to be inside this pink area. Okay, now these tiny light cones are just the local light cones at each point in space, or space-time. And this black path is the path the spaceship travels along. So right now the velocity is zero, which means the spaceship is at rest, so it just stays at x equals zero, but now I'm going to accelerate it. So you can see that I started accelerating it to 0.25 of the speed of light, and the way that I program this, it starts at rest and then accelerates to the velocity and then decelerates back to rest because I imagine that's how a warp drive would actually work. So everything is fine so far. I'm going to keep accelerating. And you can see that the path of the spaceship starts going to the right because it is now moving but it's still inside the light cone because the velocity right now 0.76 of the speed of light the velocity is still slower than light but now I'm going to accelerate this warp drive to beyond the speed of light and you can see now that it's actually coming out of the light cone okay so here for example the velocity is 2.1 
and you can see that the path of the spaceship, after it, it accelerated, it's going outside of this global light cone. Okay, and I can keep accelerating, and it can keep going out of the light cone. But, this does not violate relativity, because you can see that along the path of the spaceship, this black path over here, you can see that the, the local light cones at each point are getting tipped due to the warp drive. So, if I'm traveling along this black path, I'm actually always locally within my own light cone. So, for example, over here, you can see the light cone is tipped so that the direction of northeast is actually the direction that is inside the light cone and going to the north, which is globally the area that's inside the light cone, is actually now going outside the light cone. Okay, so at each point along this path, I'm still within my local light cone, and therefore I am locally traveling slower than light. In fact, I am locally at rest, because you can see that the path is exactly always at the same angle as the light cone. Okay, so the spaceship is at rest, locally, but globally, it's traveling faster than light and going outside of the global light cone. So, so what does that tell us about causality? If there is a light emitted from a galaxy that is moving twice the speed of light with respect to us, can this light reach us? So it, it doesn't because space between us and the galaxy is expanding faster than the photon can travel. So, in fact, the, the area where the galaxies are traveling at the speed of light is, roughly speaking, the boundary of the Hubble sphere, so the boundary of the observable universe. When galaxies are traveling faster than light, they will be outside of the sphere, and therefore we can't see them. Now, of and course, there is uh, acceleration also to this expansion, so that makes things a bit more complicated, but uh, this is the, the basic idea. What would happen to the mass of the object? Uh, I mean, the mass of the spaceship doesn't change in any case, but if you're talking about the relativistic mass, it also doesn't change because it is at rest locally. So another way to travel faster than light is using a traversable wormhole, which at least a simple wormhole is going to be given by a metric like this. And the basic idea is that there is a long way to go between two points. So this long way is given by this kind of going around. So this could be millions of light years apart. But here is a shortcut given by this wormhole that could be, I don't know, a few meters long. So, because it's a shortcut, you can effectively travel millions of light years in a few seconds. Therefore, it is essentially faster than light travel. But again, there's no violation of relativity because locally, this spaceship is always traveling slower than light. It's just that it's traveling along a shortcut. So in such a geometry, geodesics are uh, periodic, or there are periodic geodesics? Uh, so the geodesic of this spaceship would just be crossing through the shortcut, and I guess if it then flew back a thousand uh, light years to the entrance, well, it wouldn't really meet its old geodesic because there's no time traveling happening here. It's just traveling to a different point in space but presumably both of these points are at the same time or on the same hypersurface of constant time. So if it then took a thousand years to travel back the long way, it wouldn't meet itself in the past. However, we will see that you can travel back in time with faster than light travel. It's just, it's not equivalent. It's just that you can use faster than light travel to travel back in time. So here's a visualization of a wormhole. I think this is a Times Square connected to the Sahara Desert. 
and you can see here the wormhole kind of causes a lensing effect because of its curvature and by the just it's just a shortcut to get from here to here in a few seconds instead of flying in a plane which would take many hours okay so now let's talk about the feasibility of faster than light travel so there are these energy conditions in general relativity and I'll just name the few most common ones so there's a strong energy condition uh, given by this inequality so T mu nu is the stress tensor, G mu nu is the metric and T is a time-like vector so all time-like vectors have to satisfy this inequality if this condition is satisfied and basically what this means is that gravity is always attractive because you can prove that geodesics always converge so if this equation is satisfied then time like geodesics always get closer and closer as the proper time on the geodesic passes and this makes sense right because we always say gravity is attractive gravity is never repulsive so this seems like it's a condition that makes sense the weak energy condition again applies to time-like vectors t its interpretation is that observers measure non-negative energy density okay so t mu nu t mu t nu is the energy density measured by the observer and it is always non-negative there's also the null energy condition which basically says that both of these strong and weak conditions also apply not just to time-like vectors describing the paths of massive particles but also to null vectors describing the paths of massless particles so these conditions all seem to be reasonable but actually you can't prove them from anything fundamental they're just extra assumptions going into general relativity and indeed there are known violations of these energy conditions and matter that violates the energy conditions especially if it violates the weak or null energy condition which means it has negative energy density is called exotic matter so the cosmological constant you can very easily prove it violates the strong energy condition and I guess that makes sense because the strong energy condition says gravity is attractive but we know the cosmological constant is actually responsible for accelerating the expansion of space-time so it is basically making gravity be repulsive in a sense so this makes sense um, now scalar fields like the Higgs field for example it can show that they violate the strong energy condition and they can also violate the weak and null energy conditions depending how you couple them to gravity and finally and perhaps most importantly quantum fields which are basically all the known fields from which everything is made actually violate all three of these energy conditions now why am I telling you all this it's because warp drives and wormholes need exotic matter they need matter with negative energy that violates the energy conditions in order to work so for example here is the energy density measured by an observer for the warp drive so you can see it's proportional to minus v squared times x squared plus y squared over r squared times derivative of this f so this f remember it's zero outside the bubble and it's one inside the bubble so the derivative on the surface of the bubble is the only place where it's not zero so basically what this says is that the energy density is always negative on the surface of the bubble and the higher the velocity the more negative the energy would need to be and because of this term x squared plus y squared over r squared 
it actually turns out that the negative energy has to be not everywhere on the surface of the bubble, but just basically on the sides of the bubble, so parallel to the direction of motion. For the wormhole, there is a similar thing. So here is the mouth of the wormhole, and the throat is basically what the shortcut is made of. And again, on the throat, you can see here that you need negative energy in order to stabilize this throat. The conclusion is that warp drives and wormholes require matter with negative energy in order to work, and that matter violates the energy conditions, but we do know that there is matter that violates the energy conditions, so the question is, can we use that matter to actually build a wormhole or a warp drive? So if we try to do it using uh, quantum fields, which is the way that most people think it should be done. So just, just to understand, quantum fields, you mean the fields that we are familiar with, electrons, uh, quarks? Yeah, exactly. Any quantum field. So, so, so the reason why you consider it is exotic is because it's, it's quantum, it's quantized? Uh, no, so the exotic matter basically refers to any matter that has negative energy. And I think, strictly speaking, it would have to be matter that has a lot of negative energy for a long time. And what I'm going to show you now is that quantum fields only have a bit of negative energy for a short time. So it's not clear if they can actually be used as exotic matter to build these faster than light geometries. So you're talking here about the difference between the, the average energy conditions where you average you kind of even out and you get that the net is positive because you have this quantum uncertainty so it can dip negatively for a little either a little space or a little time, right? Yeah, that is one way to explain it. And you can actually do very rigorous calculations, of course with some approximations, and you can come up with inequalities that I didn't write here because they're just uh, very complicated, that actually it is basically an uncertainty principle for the amount of negative energy. Okay, and what you learn from these inequalities is three things. So here in those plots, time goes horizontally and the amount of energy goes vertically. So first of all, you learn that the longer the duration of time you have negative energy, the weaker it has to be. So here I have negative energy for a short time, so there can be a large amount of it. But here in the second plot, I have negative energy for a long time, so the amplitude of the energy has to actually be smaller. You also learn from this inequality, from this uncertainty principle, if you will, that the amount of positive energy always has to be larger than the amount of negative energy, because, as you said, you average them over the entire path. So here I have some negative energy, and here I have a larger amount of positive energy to basically cancel out the negative part. And again, here I have negative energy, and here I have positive energy to cancel out the total amount of negative energy integrated over this entire time. There's also this interesting thing called quantum interest, which says that if I have negative energy for some time and then I wait and I don't put positive energy back, then I would have to put more positive energy than I would have if I didn't wait this long. Okay, so the longer you wait before introducing positive energy, the more positive energy you have to introduce. These quantum inequalities severely limit the amount of negative energy you can generate, or if you want, the amount of exotic matter you can generate using quantum fields. And it turns out you can only generate a very small amount of negative energy for a very short time, which, according to the literature right now, doesn't seem to be nearly enough. In fact, it's orders of magnitude less 
both in amount and duration of negative energy than what you would actually need to build a warp drive or a wormhole. But in a microscopic level, you would expect that uh, quantum particles in uh, general relativity should be involved in all kinds of virtual processes in which they are moving backward in time? Sure, but virtual particles are not really particles. I mean, you can't use virtual particles to travel faster than light. You can only use them as terms in some path integral when you have to sum over all the virtual particles, but uh, there's no way to turn them into physical particles that actually travel faster than light. But this hypothetical path integral have to include the paths that are uh, going backward in time. When you do path integral, you have to sum over all the possible paths, and then some of those paths are going to be moving faster than light, but only as terms in the integral, not as actual particles moving faster than light. I don't, I'm not sure about moving backwards in time, though. Now let's talk about time travel. My conclusion from the previous few slides is that it may or may not be possible to travel faster than light because right now it looks like you probably cannot create enough exotic matter to sustain a warp drive or a wormhole, but that doesn't mean that we cannot find a way to do it in the future. These geometries do exist in general relativity they are solutions to the Einstein equation, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that you could actually create those geometries in reality. I'm going to show you how faster than light travel actually leads to time travel, and for that I have another mathematical demonstration. So here I have a space-time diagram, and I have two frames, S and S prime. Maybe S and S prime can represent, for example, two space stations or two planets. Now, I can move S prime away from S. I can also change the velocity of S prime, the relative velocity of S prime relative to S. So S is always at rest, and S prime is moving away from S with some velocity that is slower than light. Okay, now let's turn on light cones. So you can see both S and S prime have light cones and those light cones are always at a 45 degree angle. So if S prime is located here, for example, then you can see that the future light cone of S contains S prime and the past light cone of S prime contains S. And this is true no matter which velocity S prime is moving in. Okay, so when I move this slider, it really just does a law and summation, which means that the space and time axes get kind of rotated into each other. So, if I'm in a situation like this, and I have a spaceship. My spaceship can travel along this blue arrow from S to S prime, and then it can travel from S prime to the future of S prime. Here the spaceship is traveling slower than light. Now, it's also possible for the spaceship, maybe if it has a warp drive, to travel faster than light. So right now it's slower than light, so it is inside the light cone of S and also inside the light cone of S prime. But it can actually, if it can travel faster than light, it means it can come out of this light cone. And at some point, it starts looking like the spaceship is going back in time. Right? So you can see here that the direction of this arrow or the spaceship coming out of S prime is in the negative t direction, so the negative time direction of s. Of course, here, where the spaceship is traveling along the light cone, it's at the speed of light, and then I increase the speed, it comes out of the light cone. If it's traveling along the x prime axis, like here, its speed is actually infinity. 
but it can actually never travel faster than infinity, so it cannot travel below the x prime axis. So it seems like I can't actually use it to go back to negative t, to go back to before I left. But that is actually possible. So the idea is that the spaceship can only travel to the future of S prime. Let's turn on the future. Okay, so these yellow regions, this yellow region is the future of S and this yellow region is the future of S prime. The future is really just the positive values of the T axis. Okay, so this path has to be inside the future. The spaceship can only travel from the past to the future within the same frame. But now let's move S prime over here. So S prime is now causally disconnected from S. Let's make it move a bit faster. Okay, so S prime is now causally disconnected from S and it's traveling at 0.58c, for example. This is fine. It doesn't mean S has to travel faster than light. It just means that S and S prime could have started somewhere here where the past light cones intersect and then just travel in different directions. But now to get from S to S prime, this blue path is actually going, as you can see, outside of the light cone of S. So the spaceship now has to travel faster than light from S to S prime. And now when it starts traveling from S prime, it can travel, again, assuming it can travel faster than light, to any point above the X prime axis. So any point within this yellow region. So in fact, it can travel faster than light and reach this point over here which means it has now reached the past of S. Okay, so what we learn here is that S prime, if it's outside of the future light cone of S, then the future of S prime, it actually contains the past of S. And if my spaceship can travel faster than light, so it can go out of the light cones of both S and S prime, then I can actually make it such that it travels to the past of S. And this is how you can use faster and light travel to travel to the past. Well, why do you put in the restriction that you have to move forward in time or slower than infinite speed in X prime, but you don't put the same restriction for traveling slower than infinity in the system S? What, what, what no, I, is one preferable over the other? Both of them are restricted like that. So in the S system, the spaceship can only travel to places within this yellow rectangle. And in the S prime system also, it can only travel to within this yellow rectangle. So it can travel outside of the light cone, but it can't travel directly into the past. Now, if it could travel directly into the past, then of course that would be trivial kind of time travel because then, okay, I'll just travel back to the past. But the idea here is that I'm traveling to the future of S and then to the future of S prime. So the only thing I have to allow is travel faster than light. I don't have to allow the spaceship to travel actually backwards in time. But even just the assumption that the spaceship can travel to the future but faster than light is already enough for it to eventually reach a point that is in the past of S because the future of S prime contains the past of S. But S and S prime are just reference frames and I can, I can live on S and know nothing about S prime. I will be looking at this spaceship and doing this path, what would I see? I would see it going backwards in time in my frame. Do you mean the first path or the second path? S to S prime is to the future in both of them. From S prime to S, S sees it as going backwards in time, but S prime sees it as going the future because it is going from T prime equals zero to larger values of T prime. But uh, in, in any two points, 
with an interval which is space-like, maybe are in some reference system uh, in the future or in the past of each other, right? So yeah. once you're moving faster than light, you, have, you, have, you can change the, the interval between time-like and space-like, then trivially you can find them either in the past or in the future of each other, isn't it? That is the basic idea on which this is based. So the idea is that if you have two frames that are separated, so they're not causally connected, then you can make it such that the future of one includes the past of the other. Okay. And this is exactly what I'm using here to travel back in time. The only complication is that I'm not allowing the spaceship to just travel to the past. The spaceship has to travel to the future, and I'm using the fact that the future of S prime is in the past of S to make it travel back in time. Okay. Um, so I hope this makes sense. This is usually the most confusing part of my talk. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any questions about this? I have a question, not about that. I mean, this, this, I, this I feel okay with. Mm -hmm. But I think that the first part of your talk, I think you made some confusion between the locally and globally. Because according to special relativity, locally there is no way of traveling faster than light. Yeah. You're using the fact that the universe expands, and so there is no way to do a local measurement of distant galaxies. And, and indeed, in, in the framework of general relativity, it is possible that the expansion might be faster than light. It's not, it's not clear, by the way, but it is possible. Uh, and then you said, okay, now I can take this global feature of the universe and, and, and um, project it into a local frame. Now, did this move, I don't think this is a legal move that you did. Well, that's not what I did. I presented the expansion of the universe just as kind of a motivation to show you that there is kind of a loophole. But what I did for the warp drive is it's not based on the expansion of the universe. It's based on there is a finite bubble that is like, I don't know, one kilometer radius bubble that is engineered so that there is expansion behind the bubble and contraction. I understand that, but that, that, but that violates special relativity. No, it, it doesn't because this is a specific geometry that you can write down legally in general relativity and the local frame inside the bubble the spaceship is at rest there. The spaceship is actually never moving faster than light. It's at rest and space itself is moving. Right, so you engineer the space which globally might be um uh, expanding faster saying okay then I can take a local portion of the universe be the one kilometer or whatever, and then make this portion have a um, velocity difference which is faster than light. Yeah, but it's not based on the expansion of the universe. That was just a motivation to show you that space is expanding, and that's a scientific fact. And now I'm just talking about a flat universe and just one bubble within that universe that has this property that it's expanding behind and contracting in front. So essentially, it's just a bubble of space itself moving, and relativity doesn't put any speed limit on how fast space itself can move. It only puts a limit on how fast you can move that within space. Okay. Um, good. So I, I don't have a lot of time left, but I want to talk about time travel paradoxes, which is basically what I have been building towards. So the idea is that relativity makes it seem like it might be possible to travel faster than light. If that is possible, then it might be possible to travel back in time. If that happens, that creates time travel paradoxes. So there's two basic types of time travel paradoxes. The first type is called the bootstrap paradox. And it happens when an effect is its own cause or something is created from nothing. 
So, for example, let's say that a future me suddenly appears in a time machine and gives me the plans for how to build a time machine, and then I make the time machine, and then I use it to go back and give myself the same plans. So, seems like in that case, the plans for the time machine were created from nothing, because I didn't create them, and future me is still me, and he's just using the plans that he gave me. So, who wrote those plans? That is kind of a paradox. It's often presented as a paradox, although some people call it a pseudo-paradox, because it kind of assumes that those plans would exist in the first place, and that is not necessarily true. It is just a scenario that is consistent, but not necessarily possible. But a more interesting type of paradox is a consistency paradox, which is when something happens, if and only if it doesn't happen. And of course, the most well-known version of this paradox is the grandfather paradox and variations on that paradox. So if I go back to uh, 1940, and I kill my grandpa before he married my grandma and before one of my parents were born, then I wouldn't be born, then I wouldn't be able to go back in time and kill my grandpa. So, seems like I will be born if and only if I'm not born, or I kill my grandpa if and only if I don't kill my grandpa, therefore there is an inconsistency. So this is a serious problem, because if it is possible, I don't know, in 5,000 years, maybe it's technologically possible to build a time machine and I go back in time and I create a paradox by killing my grandpa or whatever. What does that mean? How can that be allowed in the universe? Of course, it cannot be allowed. It's a paradox. So you have to find a way to resolve this paradox. So there are several different uh, proposed resolutions to these paradoxes. The first is called the Hawking Chronology Protection Conjecture, uh, which is basically just the conjecture that the universe does not allow time travel. So it's kind of like the most boring resolution. People who try to prove this conjecture generally try to prove there are some quantities, like, uh, for example, the stress tensor or some scalar field, that always diverge when you try to create a time machine. So there's some papers out there where people have proven this in very specific cases, but of course no one has proven this in the general case. If they did, then it would just mean the universe does not allow time travel. A more interesting conjecture is the Novikov self-consistency conjecture which says that the universe must be consistent no matter what. So, if I go back and I try to kill my grandpa, then I just fail to do it. The gun doesn't work, or I miss, or something like that. More than that, since there's only one universe and only one timeline, then this actually has already happened. So, in fact, there's only one history, and in that history, I appeared in 1940, and I tried to kill my grandpa, and I failed. And this is just the one consistent history of the universe. There's an interesting uh, model that has also been done experimentally called the post-selected quantum time travel model that I'm not going to go into because I don't have time. But basically, they kind of simulated time travel and they showed that consistent evolutions are actually being selected for. The most interesting resolution to paradoxes, in my opinion, is the multiple histories or multiple timelines. So basically what this means is that the universe branches whenever time travel occurs. For example, there's the initial timeline where my grandpa is alive, and then I'm born, and then I enter a time machine. And then when I exit the time machine, I'm now in a different timeline, timeline number two, where I then kill my grandpa. So then in timeline number two, I'm never born, but in timeline number one, I was born and entered the time machine. And therefore there is no inconsistency because these two timelines are actually unrelated to each other. 
so I have a few slides about uh, my own research with my oh, student. So who, killed, who killed your grandfather in the alternative universe? Uh, I did. But you so were never he, born in this universe, so it's not consistent. No, no. So that's exactly the point. So there's two timelines. There's timeline one, timeline two. In timeline one, I am born and I go into a time machine. When I exit the time machine in the past, I exit in timeline two. And then I kill my grandfather, so I'm never born in timeline number two. But I came from timeline number one, where I am born. So killing my grandfather in timeline two does not affect whether I'm born or not in timeline number one. There's no, now there's no conservation of energy, momentum, or whatever. You can just move particles around from one timeline to another timeline, and locally I would see matter or a rock coming out of nothing. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, in general relativity, there isn't conservation of energy and momentum anyway, unless you have specific... Strongly disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I strongly disagree with that. Well, if your system is not symmetric to time shifts, then there is no energy conservation. And definitely, if you have a time machine, then the system is not symmetric to shift in time, and therefore the energy is just not conserved by Nettles theorem. But I think my time is over, so let me just tell you this research I did with Jacob Hauser was basically we realized that people always talk in the literature about multiple histories as resolutions to time travel paradoxes, but it's never actually been seriously studied. In the 50 years where people have been talking about time travel, no one has ever done a concrete and rigorous treatment of what it might look like if there are multiple histories. Can they solve all kinds of paradoxes or not? Can there be different types of multiple histories? Do we have to have an infinite number of them? Or can there be just a finite number of histories and maybe that is enough to solve all paradoxes? So that is what we did in our paper that you can read on the archive that also has been featured in an article in New Scientist that you can see here. So since I'm out of time, I'm not going to talk about the actual research, but I hope that you will read this paper if you are interested. So thank you. Thank you, Barak. Any further questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question uh, regarding the multiple history scenario. So mm -hmm. basically, if time travel, uh, well, I, I think if you have mul multiple histories, then in a sense there is no tri time travel, only branching. So, yeah. so okay, so this is one thing. So it's no longer time travel, exactly. But uh, there is another question that arises from this uh, issue, which is there is branching. So how does the branching work? How can you, I mean, what is the mechanism of such branching? And I mean... How can this even be? And even if you think of uh, some, I don't know, many uh, type of uh, universes that all occur uh, simultaneously, I mean, all uh, exist simultaneously, how can you, basically what it means is you move from one universe to the other, and is it a reversible process? I mean, there's many questions you can ask regarding this branching, so... Basically, yeah. well, okay, I guess the first one is what is the mechanism of such a branching? I mean, why do you think such a branching could even exist? Right, so these are all great questions, and indeed, these are exactly the questions that led me to actually work on this research. And in my paper, I answer or try to answer some of those questions. One of them, the one you asked last about the mechanism, that might be given by Deutsch's quantum time travel model, where he showed that there is a relation between solving time travel paradoxes and the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Let me be more, more precise. He didn't actually show that. He showed that quantum mechanics can resolve time travel paradoxes, as long as you make a few small changes to quantum mechanics itself in the presence of a time machine. So he showed that quantum mechanics can solve time travel paradoxes. 
and he conjectured that this might be related to the Manning Walls interpretation because basically the Manning Walls interpretation tells me that when I measure a spin of an electron and I get either plus one half or minus one half, then I split into two versions of myself. One is Barak that measured plus one half and another is Barak that measured minus one half. And the entire universe, in fact, splits into two versions, one where the spin was plus one half and one where the spin was minus one half. A similar mechanism could be responsible for how these branches happen mm. when you travel back in time. But of course, these branches, the interesting thing about them is it's not like a new universe is created. It's still the same universe. It's just that you're in a different term in the superposition of the state of the universe. So that mechanism is kind of like the most natural mechanism for creating new branches. It just creates another term in the superposition, and that's it. And I think about it as uh, some sort of entanglement between branches from the universal wave function, sort of? Yeah, that's basically how this interpretation works. When I measure the qubit, I get entangled with it, and as a result, the whole universe gets entangled with it eventually. Similarly, when I go back in time, when I exit the time machine, and now there's two different terms in superposition, one where I didn't exit the time machine, one where I did exit the time machine, and each one of those different terms in the superposition represents an entanglement of the whole universe with either me coming out of the time machine or me not coming out of the time machine. So effectively creates a new branch of this universal wave function. Okay, thank you. And the other thing you mentioned, uh, which is also a good question, is the multiple history solution actually means you don't travel back in time because you never close a time loop. You just go back and then you exit in a different timeline. So technically, you just moved to a different timeline. You didn't go back in time in your own timeline. But of course, effectively, it's the same. Like if I go back to kill Hitler, Hitler is going to be there because the timeline was the same up to that point. So for all intents and purposes, I did travel back in time to the time where Hitler was alive, and then I, of course, kill him. Yes, but then you live in an entire different universe and can go back to your... I mean, can you go back to, your, to the original universe? That's another question. That's something we talked about in the paper, and you can go back to the original universe, as long as there are enough different histories. So we, of course, talked about a very simple toy model, not about a person going back to kill another person, which, of course, you can't model in a mathematical model. But for the simple model we had, we showed that the histories can actually be cyclic. So you can actually... You can either have infinite multiple histories or cyclic multiple histories where there's only two timelines, and here the particle goes into the time machine and comes out here, and collides with itself, and here it goes into the time machine in the second timeline and comes back in the first timeline. So, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to explain um, these plots, but yeah, we showed that you can go back to the original timeline if the model is simple enough. Okay, thank you. But then being able to go back and creating a loop, wouldn't that just reintroduce all of the paradoxes just with two, two, uh, two hops instead of one hop? Yeah, so the idea is that if you're a human going back in time to kill your grandfather and then you come back to your original timeline, you would create a paradox because that would be equivalent to you going back in time in your original timeline. What we showed is that for a simple paradox model, it can be allowed to go back to original timeline, assuming that you behave in a predictable way. If you do behave in a predictable way, which in our case means those certain interaction vertices between particles, then you actually can go back to your original timeline without causing a paradox. And this, of course, is possible because the model is very simple, but one can imagine that a human is really just the trajectories of trillions upon trillions of different particles with certain interaction vertices. So 
theoretically speaking, that might be possible for a human, but I don't really know if that makes any sense or not. I guess you have to ask if humans behave deterministically and you can predict what they're doing, and if so, then we showed that you can actually go back to your original history. I think you still have determinism in, in both scenarios with uh, one history, obviously, and uh, the multiple history is also consistent with uh, determinism. Right. Maybe it's not exactly about determinism, it's about free will, but I don't want to say free will because then we're going to have to keep talking for the next five hours about what exactly that even means. But the idea is that if you have free will to go back and kill your grandfather, then you're going to create a paradox. And the Novikov conjecture basically takes away free will because it says you go back and no matter how hard you try to kill him, you'll never be able to because that would be inconsistent. And in this case, you do have free will because you can go back and do whatever you want in the second timeline. And when you come back to the original timeline, because everything is deterministic, you actually don't have that free will anymore to make changes in your own timeline which is why I call this the hybrid Novikov plus multiple histories solution, because it kind of allows free will, but also kind of doesn't. So in this particular scenario, this is how things work. But in the infinite multiple history scenario, where you just have an infinite number of histories, one after the other, then you have the free will to do whatever you want. Okay. We can talk about it uh, later. Uh yeah. There's much I, much I can say about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Thank I'm you. happy to talk about it. I think we'll declare the, uh, the official end of, of the talk. Uh, that would have multiple consequences in our timeline. One is that later would be now. So if anyone wants to stay on for free engagement uh, discussions with Barak, you're most welcome to do. So uh, it, almost as if we actually could meet physically uh, in another timeline. Uh, the second consequence is that once this is over, uh, Barak will share the recording with us and we'll have it on, the, on YouTube for, for the channel with the rest of the seminars from this, uh, from this series. So anyone could join at a later time and view it as if he were almost traveling back in time to view it uh, online with us. Uh, and the third thing is that I would like to announce next week's uh, seminar, which is about detection of gravitational waves and their analysis from neutron star mergers with uh, neural networks and machine learning. So same time next week. And Barak, you're now officially the host of the rest of this uh, session, and you can take it wherever you'd like. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.